So, okay. Oh, there we go. We're <laughs> starting. I can't actually see people coming on, but uh, I think we'll give everybody a minute to, to, to kind of gather and get logged in. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting uh, to get started, um, in the chat box, if you're interested, you know, if you want to tell us uh, your senior dog's name, um, if you have had any uh, experiences with heartworm disease, we'd love to hear about those. Um, if you've dealt with heartworm positive dog in your life. Um, but Jackie and I are excited to be here and we're just going to get everybody a minute to, to kind of get locked in and then we'll get going. Oh. Uh, did I have, do you have anything to add, Jackie? Or did... <laughs> Again, I always, I'm just interested if um, anyone has put a dog through heartworm treatment, if they adopted a dog that was heartworm positive, um, yeah. that had been treated already, you know, those stories are always interesting to me. Um, both Ashley and I deal with heartworm differently in our, you know, scope, and we'll get to that. But so if you've dealt with heartworm or um, have been through it before, we'd love to hear a little about that in the question and answer or chat box as well. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, let's give them a couple more minutes. Um, okay. It's really like 2.01. I wouldn't even be on time for this, and I'm hosting it. <laughs> I'd be rolling in right now myself. Um, yeah, I was going to say, we've had a lot of fun putting this together, and we've had fun trying to figure out titles, because heartworm, is there's so many things you can do with it. Like, uh, don't go breaking my heart. No love lost for heartworm. We've we've really enjoyed uh, kind of putting this together, so we're excited to share share with you all. So, yeah, um, I feel like we had a, like right. a more silly one too. Um, yeah, love to hate heart, love to hate heartworms. Yes. I can't remember them all. There's just the, the options are endless out there. <laughs> oh, Tanisha's here with uh, Pet Matt RX watching with her pity opal. Ah, oh, hello. Oh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Denise said our comments are, I mean, our titles are clever. <laughs> That's what yeah, we're here for. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to do when you talk about heartworm. So we've had a lot of yeah. heartworm positive pity. So uh, we yes. keep them not heartworm positive. Yes. Right. All right. I think Jackie, feel, feel ready for this. Uh, let's do it. Let's I'll go. do a little intro okay. on myself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no love lost for heartworms. Um, Jackie and I are super excited to, to be here with you guys and um, share our, our knowledge. The truth is, uh, like Jackie said, we both have a lot of professional experience around this in the veterinary field and the shelter and rescue world, and also uh, a lot of personal experience with heartworm, which is why I think we have bonded so nicely over this topic and, and had a blast doing it. So um, the only housekeeping item I was going to say is if you have questions, we'd love, we love questions. We'd love to chat about those. So, um, if you want to put those in the Q and a, um, section, that would be great. And we'll go over those at the end. And then, yeah, if you want to keep sharing any experiences with heartworm or, or tell us about your senior dog, um, that's obviously a big part of our, our, uh, lives as well. So we're, we're happy to be here. So I'll turn it over to Jackie. Yeah. And to re reiterate what Ashley said, we're going to give you our backgrounds. Um, we're doing this because yeah. we find that we assume everyone understands the backgrounds of heartworm, but um, it comes up a lot that they don't. So don't think anything is too silly to ask. We'd rather you ask because based on the questions we get, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions and we'll go into that as well. But please, nothing is embarrassing to ask. We're happy to go over anything. This is yeah. me and my kids. I love them all so much. I'm Jackie. Um, I originally actually started in business. I graduated from Emory. I was in advertising for about 10 years and then actually wanted to see how I could use my business skills and save animals instead. I think my business people thought I was crazy. Um, they were like, are you having like a breakdown <laughs> or like, do you need to just like move markets? And I was like, no, I just want to save dogs. Um, so I went into shelter and I've been probably every role. I've been a rescue coordinator. I've been head of development and fundraising. I've been the uh, executive director for a couple of shelters, and now I'm on the board of directors here at Gray Muscle. Um, I don't know if you can see the middle picture is my actual dog, Tally, who is the face of this webinar, because I'm obsessed with old dogs in general. So I saw Tally's picture 
in a very rural shelter in Jill in Georgia. I actually live in Florida now, and I just knew she had to come live with me. I, ne I never even met her. She was way fatter than she is in that picture. Um, and a girlfriend of mine drove her down and then she tested positive for heartworms. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I put her through treatment. Um, the dog on the left, the black dog is the love of my life, Fizzle, who I had, you know, majority of his life for 10 plus years. My mom just told me she's watching. <laughs> um, and on the right hand side is Walter, who I adopted a couple of years ago from another rural shelter. And he was um, called hospice at the time. They thought he only had a couple more months to live. He looked miserable at the time. And I have a couple more pictures of him later in this presentation. Um, and he was heartworm positive. And because he was considered hospice, it wasn't really considered worth it to them to put him through treatment. But I was like, uh, we're gonna give him the best life we can possibly give. So I insisted that we put him through real heartworm protocol. And he ended up living for almost two years with me. I, the life he lived, the joy he brought to so many people, um, even as an old man, I think he like convinced hundreds of people to adopt old dogs because he was just like the life of the party everywhere he went. So these are just some faces that have changed my life. And two of the three came with heartworms and are just incredible dogs that I'm so glad were able to overcome and be treated and live good lives. That's why I'm here. Oh, thanks, Jackie. Love it. I love it. So, um, yeah, my name is Ashley Ackley. I am a small animal vet in Denver. Um, I work for Western Veterinary Partners and I'm a Colorado native. I've lived here my whole life. I did all my schooling at Colorado State University. Now I live um, with my husband and two dogs, two senior dogs and a grumpy cat. Um, and I'm, I'm the newest member of the board of gray, uh, board of directors for gray muzzle organization, just super, super honored and, and proud of what gray muzzle does. And especially now being behind the scenes, just, just the amount of thought and, um, effort that goes into, uh, what gray muzzle is as an organization is just amazing. And I'm, I'm so thankful to share the screen with Jackie, a, a kindred spirit um, in this, uh, but everybody on the, the board um, and the staff is amazing. So um, my, my heartworm story, this is Dollar, we now call him Dollar Bill, because he has been expensive. Um, but I saw him on Pet Finder randomly searching for, for senior labs. That's kind of been our thing. And he was in Oklahoma. And I just saw his face and said, oh my gosh, this is my dog. So they considered him a hospice dog as well. Eight to 10 years old, which we still feel like two years later, he's eight to 10 years old. But uh, I said, I can treat his heartworm. Um, and he's just been such a, an amazing, strange dog, but an amazing dog. And it's been a, a wild ride um, trying to, to deal with his heartworm and a lot of the other issues that he came with. But uh He's got some, some pretty severe lung damage. He's not able to do a lot of the same things that uh, a dog his age might be able to, but uh, we love him and that's that's why we're here. And that's why I think we're, we're really passionate about this disease, so. Awesome. And just for those who aren't familiar with the Gray Muzzle Organization, the main focus is improving the lives of senior dogs. We don't want any old dog to die alone and afraid in a shelter. We want to give them that retirement home and relief from any medical issues they have. And we do that by providing funding and resources to various shelters and rescue groups. We want to enable them across the nation to be able to save more dogs by us providing those resources. Um, so we cover medical and dental. Old dogs are known for having a lot of dental, so we cover that. Um, hospice care, foster uh, care as well. And then even keeping dogs in homes if it's about the medical that the owner can't take care of, but they can still keep their beloved pet in their home. We want to help with that as well. So we build those relationships with those various rescues and shelters across the country. Um, and you can see some of the numbers. This past year is our most ever we have given out in grants, $848,000 just this year to 90 different groups, which also lets us touch so many different areas, so many different um, types of help, depending on what's needed in that market. You know, sometimes heartworms is the issue in that market. Sometimes um, keeping pets in home is what they need to learn more about um, how to care best for their pet and um, 
take care of the dentals, et cetera, with us. Um, and so again, it's 29 states and including Puerto Rico. And it brought us to 4.6 million in grants over brain muscles history of 15 years. So hopefully um, we're gonna blow that out of the water next year for any that are interested in wanting to be a part of it. You can learn a ton about our grants. We do webinars about those as well to help you be successful in getting a grant. We launched them in February, but we have stuff you know, on our website and all throughout the year where you can learn more if you received a grant and used it. Um, for a heartworm or anything along those lines. We'd love to hear about that too. Um, but we're really focused on dogs not being overlooked in the shelter environment just because they're old or just because they have a medical issue. And certainly not because they have heartworms because they're treatable. There's so many other things that um, you know we do lose our pets over, but heartworms shouldn't be one of them because it's not meant to be a deadly disease if you can treat it. So that's super important to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, and the main reason we're here. So as I actually mentioned, she's a vet in a private practice. I've been in shelter for over a decade and yet we hear the same things that I think to us, we take for granted um, that it's just known, but clearly it's not, or we're not doing enough to reinforce these kind of topics of um, that heartworm is only transmitted in the summer. The number one is that, um, how heartworms are transmitted. We hear it all the time that people think when they test for intestinal parasites like tapeworms and roundworms that they think they're testing for heartworms as well. Um, that natural remedies are as good as regular prevention. Um, that it's rarely fatal. Oh, another number one that, oh, my dog lives inside. He doesn't need prevention. I would say I hear these, if not every day, every other day. It's just so, so common. So we wanna make sure, even if you know a majority of these things, and if you don't, um, but that we can encourage you that when you're talking to your friends, I mean, just ask them what they think. And I bet you'll find that more than expected don't actually understand it. And they definitely don't know how it's tr or transmitted. Um, and we hope that this helps get the word out a little better of understanding and at least avoiding so many dogs coming in positive. I'm in the South and I would say 80% of the dogs that come into shelters, I should have a more concrete number. It's really, really high how many dogs are positive. And I, I can't think that that's all neglect. I think it's really misunderstanding how it's transmitted and how to manage it better. But I think we give so much information all the time that sometimes it's hard to take it all in when you're out of that appointment or out of shelter, et cetera. So we have to do better on communicating it, not just me and Ashley, but we need y'all out on the street telling your people, telling your neighbors, telling your family, um, because it's so much easier to prevent it than treat your pet. And there's so much that goes into treatment that's painful, et cetera. So these are some of the myths. We're going to go into all of them as we go along. Yes. Thanks, Jackie. So. <laughs> This is the least exciting slide that we have. And I'm sure this is exactly what you wanted to see on your Thursday afternoon, the life cycle. You'll think, oh my gosh, this is so boring. Or this is not important, um, yada, yada. But um, it actually is really important for testing, understanding how we test, as well as treatment, understanding how we treat. And so I've really kind of pared this down. And hopefully if you take one thing from this, it is that there has to be a mosquito involved. Heartworm is transmitted by mosquitoes. So um, we'll just run through this real quick. So basically you have a, a mosquito that has heartworm in it and it bites a dog. So those baby heartworms, it basically is in, goes into the blood. These little tiny baby heartworms swim around the bloodstream. And then heartworm clearly loves the heart. Uh, and so basically these little baby worms swim around and then they set up shop in the heart, particularly a place called the pulmonary arteries. Um, but they, they decide this is where we're going to live and they hang out there and they grow and they start to cause all these problems, but they, they grow until about six to seven months. That's when we consider them adult worms. And that's really important because that, that goes into how we test. Uh, but six to seven months, you're considered an adult. You're living in the heart. You're having a great time. You can live in the heart for five to 
five to seven years, these worms. Um, this picture on the bottom left, I think, it just kind of shows all of these worms. And, and we have some pictures I think you'll see of, of hearts where you open them up and there they are. Uh, but they basically sit there, they clog everything up and they cause a lot of damage. So five to seven years, one heartworm can, can live. Um, basically they, they will start to reproduce at some point. And then all of those tiny baby worms called microfilaria, fun little term. Um, so those baby worms will start to swim in the bloodstream and then a mosquito could bite that infected dog and then they're infected and then they start the cycle all over again. So um, it's, it's kind of one of those things where the biggest point again is that a mosquito has to be involved. Adults live in the heart, adult heartworms live in the heart. That's the only place that you'll find them. And it takes six to seven months for them to be considered adult worms. And so that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, but uh, testing, is why some of this matters. And again, this may be not, not super exciting. And a lot of you are probably like, oh my gosh, here we are in biology. But this is something that everybody, usually when you go to the vet, your vet will, will steal your dog, or maybe they do it in front of you and they say, we're gonna take a couple drops of blood and we're gonna do this test on the upper right here called an antigen test. And that's the, the Across the board, that's the test for heartworm disease. It's actually testing, um, it's called an antigen test because antigen is what the adult heartworm is producing. And so that's why you test, um, it takes six months for a test to show up positive because they have to be adult worms to, to show up positive on this test to produce antigen. Um, they also have to be female, which is also something that I don't understand nor will go into, but I just find that fascinating. They have to be adult female worms. Um, and so that's why, you know, if you get a puppy, your vet might say, hey, we'll test them at six months or, or wait until at least that point. That's kind of the earliest, um, six or seven months. Uh, but that's why you're not testing a puppy at like eight weeks. They wouldn't show up positive. So if your dog tests positive on that test, um, a lot of times what we'll do is confirm, confirm that that's truly, truly there. And so we might run another one or we might look for what are called microfilaria. And again, those are the tiny baby worms. And if you take a drop of blood in a dog that's infected with heartworm really severely, so there are lots of adult worms and they've been producing all these tiny baby worms, um, on the upper right here, this is actually a blood film or upper left, excuse me, this is a blood film. You can take a drop of blood and look under the microscope and see these microfilaria, these tiny baby worms. And it's kind of cool and kind of horrific at the same time. Um, but I have seen that on several, several dogs. So um, there are plenty of reasons where you might not actually see these. And as you're treating a dog, a lot of times their microfilaria numbers will get lower and lower and lower. Uh, but uh, it's something that we, we do after we've seen, oh gosh, yep, they're, they're positive on this, this little blood test. The other point I was gonna make is that if you have a dog that tests positive and then you're, you're saying, oh gosh, yep, we're gonna treat them. A lot of times, in, in, at least in private practice, I'll recommend what's called an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart because that's where those adult heartworms are living. And so when you do an ultrasound of the heart, you can see them. We did this in my dog, could see them just swimming around, hanging out in the arteries. It's disgusting and again, kind of cool. Um, but uh, the big reason for an echocardiogram or an ultrasound is because you also want to know how badly these worms are impacting the heart and the blood flow. Because if you can imagine, everything's just getting all clogged up in there. And so an echocardiogram can really tell you how well that heart is being able to function when they've got heartworms there. So sometimes you can see the difference in how well they're getting blood and oxygen to the rest of their body by doing an echocardiogram. Obviously that's not something that, that we do on every case, uh, but I do think it's something to consider uh, if it's feasible, whether it's your own, your own pet or uh, you're working for some of these shelters and rescues and echo can be really helpful. So. Ashley, before you move right. on, you can move uh -huh. back. I had a couple of comments I wanted to 
just I noticed. Um, oh, so yeah. there's a picture um, of about heartworm positive dogs at the bottom that I actually took at my own vet in North Florida when I was treating the older dog, Walter. And it shows that there's a hundred plus cases per clinic in every vet office in Florida. So just my Southern friends who think like, what's the chances? The chances are pretty high in the South. Uh, there's just, we, we just are infested in the South. So a hundred per cases per every single vet office, at least in Florida. And this is North Florida, because it's pretty much Georgia as well. Um, so just, that was my own personal picture while I was treating a heartworm positive dog. <laughs> um, and the six oh, months oh. thing, just because this comes up a lot in shelter is um, often someone adopts a dog that we tested in a shelter environment and came up heartworm negative. And then a couple months later, they go to their own vet and the dog tests heartworm positive. And they say, you lied to me. You said the dog was heartworm negative. Um, and now he's positive. And to Ashley's point, and I didn't understand this in the doctor way, but it has to be six months after they were bitten by the mosquitoes. So, you know, if they were bitten, bit, uh, <laughs> like one month before you adopted or three months before you adopted, it wouldn't show up on the test. So, uh, and I absolutely understand why people felt like they were misled or, you know, the shelter pulled a fast one on them, but it truly won't show up on the test. So I, I do want to make sure everyone here understands and please tell your friends that too because I don't ever want people to think a shelter was trying to like trick someone into taking a heartworm positive dog it just doesn't show up on the test until it's six months post positive and that's just how it is based on the life cycle of the worm um, which is yeah, interesting yeah. but it's just unfortunately yeah. how it goes and I would encourage people to go back to the shelter sometimes they'll treat it anyway sometimes people take on the treatment but it's just um based on how the tests work. Maybe we'll get better. Maybe yeah. the tests will get more, you know, sensitive. Yeah. To I think that that's a, that's a wonderful point. And I should say it's at least six months. So it could be seven months or eight months in there. Like th that's really the earliest, earliest time. Um, but that's why a lot of times, you know, we've actually seen Colorado has a 2% um, chance of, of when we test, they're getting 2% positive cases. Uh, right now. And a lot of times if they're coming from out of state or you don't know the history, we'll say come back in, in six months. Um, I have a perfect example. My vet friend actually adopted a dog. Uh, it was from New Mexico, which also we don't see a, a ton of cases, um, but she adopted a dog, was negative. She tested it again two months later, was negative, and then tested again for six months because of, I don't know why she, she, did it again, but she was like, this has to be wrong. It's positive because the dog had been on heartworm preventative the whole time. Must have just been that window. And uh, lo and behold, she had to put her, her dog through heartworm treatment as well. So it happens. Um, so that's a great point to make, Jackie. All righty. I call this the sad slide because it was, again, a learning curve for me too. But this top picture of this dog that looks pregnant, and it wasn't this exact dog, but I've had two dogs come in look like this. Um, and truly, we 100% thought the dogs were pregnant, but they were actually at end stage heartworm disease um, because their bodies fill up with so much fluid at the end of heart failure. Um, so that's why it's so important to test early, to pay attention if your dog has symptoms. Obviously in the early stages, there aren't any symptoms, but we wanna to touch on what they could be having. A cough is one of the most important because that's really far along. And a lot of times um, when a dog has a cough, the first automatic thought is like, oh, it might be kennel cough, what have you. And, and, and that's fine, you can treat for that too. But if the cough doesn't resolve, we encourage you to push to ask for further testing to do a heartworm test, which is, very easy. You can usually just make a tech appointment to do that because it's if it's not resolving, there's bigger issues going on and the coughing is definitely one. And then the difficulty breathing, the swollen belly. Um, and Ashley touched on, if you think about it, the hearts or the worms are strangling the heart. So it's not letting blood flow get out. It's not letting oxygen get to other organs. So that's why they start failing. Obviously the heart is getting damaged, but the lungs are getting damaged, the kidneys are going to start failing. I mean, this is a true death sentence for the dog if it's not treated. And as I said in the beginning, they shouldn't have to 
pass away for something that's treatable, um, but it is going to be um, the end for them if not treated. And I will say, because I've seen dogs come in in such terrible shape, I'm like on the morbid side and actually on the happy side at a pet. You know, I'm in a, <laughs> a I've been in a shelter environment where I've seen dogs in bad shape, and it's a terrible way for them to have to pass away. It's a very slow and painful death. They are um, gasping for air. Um, it's just not how we ever want them to go. And there's so much earlier stage you could get this taken care of. So um, for your own pets, and obviously we want to keep encouraging, and you know, we need like a street team out there to be looking out for other pets. That again, people just don't know. We're not, I'm not assuming people are um, trying to neglect their pets, but they don't know to look out for things. Um, that the, even if they're far along, we have treated a lot of dogs that have been far along and still been able to treat them. So, but this is all what happens as the further along the disease goes. So you can see in the bottom left, that heart that is, is you know, saturated with worms. Um, and we've even, you know, it's not the route we want to go and not something we do often, but when it's too far along to treat or if treatment fails the normal way, vets have gone in and even like pulled the worms individually out of the heart. It's just, you know, not, I mean, that's a huge massive surgery and it's not always successful, but it has happened and it has been successful. Um, so we, again, want to catch it way earlier, even before the coughing, ideally, because that's, um, again, when it's further along, but there's just so much we can do to take care of this way before. <laughs> You see, I feel passionate about the before. <laughs> yeah. ah, and my best favorite is the preventing. Um, treatment is expensive. I've put two dogs through it. Um, my most recent one was pretty expensive. Um, the other one, I had a little shelter help. So I will say that if you had got the heartworm positive dog, please make sure you talk to the shelter because a lot of times they will cover or help with treatment in encouraging people to adopt. That's what we obviously want to do with um, giving our grants out. But monthly preventatives, you could buy seven years of preventatives for less than it costs to treat a dog and put them through heartworm treatment. It's thousands of dollars. Um, so when people are often like, oh, I can't afford to buy prevention, you really can versus doing the um, treatment. And what I encourage people is, I think a lot of times we got caught up in needing to buy a year's worth or six months worth, but I have tons of friends and clients that buy one month at a time of prevention. And you can do that at your vet or even at um, humane societies, et cetera. You can buy one month at a time for 15 or $18 and you're saving your dog's life and saving thousands of dollars in treatment. So that's 100% the best route to go. Um, and I'm sure Ashley gets this even more than me, but in regards to brands, that's also a hot topic, at least in my world, of people either love a brand or hate a brand um, or think a brand is like trying to hurt their dog. Um, personally, there is no best brand. We often say that it's what works best for your dog. Um, there's brands that don't work good for some dogs that work amazing for another dog. There's like, you know, the all-in-one flea tick and heartworm that people don't like that other people love. So we don't care what brand you use. We just care that you use some kind. I personally use NextGuard and HeartGuard. I know people that don't like it. Um, but again, choose whichever brand you like or that works with your uh, budget, et cetera. Just use some kind of preventative versus having to go through the treatment. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the preventatives are, are typically very, very safe and well tolerated. Um, but to Jackie's point, yeah, there are some, some different options out there these days. And so talking to your vet about what's best for you and your, your family is, is a great idea. So, um, so this is the best treatment to prevent. This is the, the treatment that happens when you go, oh no, my dog is positive on that test that my vet did. Um, this is when it kind of becomes a super bummer and, and gets really real when you have a dog that, that is heartworm positive. Again, this means that there are adult worms living in the heart, uh, when we know that a dog has tested positive on the, on the test. So 
Uh, basically, we're doing what's called adulticide therapy, meaning we are killing the adult worms from the heart. Um, there are, it's typically one product called malarsamine. That's the, the drug name. There are lots of different names for it. You'll hear diroban or midicide, um, all kind of the same thing. But uh, the goal here is when you have a test that's positive, you need to do this. You need to do adulticide therapy. You need to kill the worms that are in the heart. Uh, it's a fairly, the protocol uh, that we use most commonly, it's, a, it's laid out by the American Heartworm Society, which is a wonderful resource of a bunch of nerdy people that love heartworm, I guess, and mosquitoes. I don't know how they decide they want to work for the American Heartworm Society, but they're the most up-to-date on all of the, the latest research and, and information out there. And so um, they have a pretty specific protocol. Um, it's three injections with steroids and antibiotics, as well as monthly preventatives. Um, and it's pretty consistent. It's considered that this is considered the, the gold standard, the most ideal way to treat a, um, a dog with, with heartworm disease. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about it, but uh, it's quite intense. So even as a veterinarian, having to follow this protocol, which is all laid out in terms of day, this day, day, this day, you do this, you do this, you switch these medications. It's really intense um, and it's long. It's three months of, of treatment, exercise restriction for six months, five to six months, um, pretty, pretty intense. And, and uh, it can be really painful uh, for the dog to go through. A lot of dogs go through this. The majority of them do great, but uh, it's definitely a sad thing to watch your dog have to get its injection, his injections. And even if you do this, this is again, trying to kill those adult worms. Uh, you can have chronic damage. Even if you treat them and, and get everything, uh, they can still have issues. So this, this picture is my, my own dog. And this is why I fell in love with him. I said, oh my gosh, he's a hospice case. Who cannot want to take that, that face home? Um, and you can see on the side, his little shaved spot where uh, the ultrasound was used to look at his heart. And again, you can see all the worms swimming in there, which yeah, I think is kind of cool. And again, really, really sad. Uh, but uh, yeah, so again, that's the most common, common way that we, we treat through the American Heartworm Society. And the questions that I get around about, uh, we get around this. So it's three injections. Um, and there's a lot of research that has gone into this. The goal when we do three injections over a period of months is that we're really trying to decrease the risk of complications. Uh, Cause if you can imagine, if you just go in and kill a bunch of worms, all these worm pieces break off and go in your heart and your lungs and the rest of your body. So we're really trying to minimize the complications that can happen, especially if they have a lot of worms in their heart. Uh, but we also wanna try to maximize our, our success, our outcome with treatment. So two injections we know is maybe 90% effective. Um, three injections, there's a 98% success rate. My suspicion is things will continue to change as heartworm develops uh, and, and they get smarter because we do see resistance with this and we see resistance with the preventatives too. Uh, I don't know how common that is, but I know we're starting to see more cases. So that's, that's always a concern there. But uh, the two injections, if you were to just give two, you usually give them a day apart. Again, you're killing a bunch of worms at one time. And so that can be really, really, really hard on the body. So the three injections usually give an injection after a month of some medications and then you wait a month and then do two more. And so uh, two more a day apart. So you're, you're giving one and you're, you're letting that kind of kick and letting those, some of those worms die off and then you're doing two in, in succession a day apart. So um, that's the goal with the, the, the three injections if you're following the American Heartworm Society protocol. Again, that's not always feasible for different reasons, cost, getting them out of shelters and, and into homes and, and things like that. I would say that um, certainly there are, are cases that don't fall into this category, but I think this is I ideal if, if possible. So you may hear about this slow kill method. There's been a lot of talk in uh, my profession about it and I'm guessing in the, in the shelter and rescue world as well. Uh, but basically 
But the slow kill method is putting an animal, a dog on preventatives. So the monthly pills that you give, um, but you're doing that long-term. So the preventatives do have some efficacy, particularly uh, uh, against the little tiny baby worms, those microfilaria. So you're slowly killing those first and you're slowly weakening those adult worms. But uh, if heartworms can live for, for five to seven years and you can continue to, you know, you, you risk damage of your heart, your lungs, or other organs for that period of time, this can take, take years to, to work. And so it's not ideal. Uh, and I feel like, yes, there are some cases that probably fall into this category that people are using it for, but it's, it's something that I'd highly recommend against if at all possible, because the sooner you treat these, the sooner the dog can go on and hopefully have a good quality of life. So the other thing that's interesting is uh, why do dogs go on steroids and antibiotics? And I think this is a really, really interesting thing that happens um, with heartworm. And so that's usually the first month is often just on steroids and, and antibiotics. And so there's this bacteria called the Wolbachia bacteria, um, and it has a symbiotic relationship with uh, heartworm. Again, nature, it's, it's crazy. Uh, but uh, they have found this bacteria is, is very, very inflammatory. Um, and so when dogs are being treated for heartworm and these bacteria start to die as well, uh, a lot of times it can be a main or a big cause of, of some of the, the issues that we see with treatment, um, some of the inflammation that can happen. And so the complication risk can be higher if they have this bacteria. So we put everybody on a, an antibiotic to treat this bacteria that loves to, loves to live with heartworm and try to wreak havoc on our dogs um, together. So the steroids we use for inflammation. So again, this is a, this is a really, really inflammatory disease, which is kind of crazy because uh, you think, oh gosh, they just go to the heart, they cause heart and lung damage while well, your body doesn't like foreign things in it. And so it's always fighting that as well. And heartworm produces all sorts of um, inflammatory reactions in the, in the body. And so the steroids are used to decrease the risk of inflammation, especially when you start to treat the, treat them for heartworm and all of these little pieces can break off and again, cause more inflammation in your body. So that's why they're, they're on it. Um, this is not a fun thing to have to put your dog on steroids for it's necessary, but it's not fun because if anybody's ever had a dog on steroids, sometimes the drinking and the peeing is excessive and not fun to deal with. And also they often are, are much hungrier, uh, on steroids. So, uh, along with, with this, we are exercise restricting these dogs. And this is probably the biggest piece uh, that goes along for, for owners. And this is another reason when you have a, a young dog with heartworm trying to exercise restrict them for six months of their lives is really challenging. But if you can imagine those worms are sitting in your heart and they're clogging everything up. So you're not getting the appropriate blood and oxygen uh, to the rest of your body, like Jackie said. So you don't want to be running a marathon, nor do you want to be making your dog that has heartworm run a marathon when they have worms in their lungs. So exercise restriction is important in that aspect, but when you're treating them, again, all of these dead worm pieces are breaking off, causing inflammation, clotting in your, your lungs and your heart. And so um, basically we want them to be as calm as possible. We don't wanna get their heart rate up. We don't wanna change how they're breathing because all of that increased need for blood and oxygen can just worsen everything going on and they can throw clots um, everywhere. So uh, it's really, really important. And that's probably the hardest, I think one of the hardest things about having a dog at home, training them for heartworm and being like, don't, don't run, don't get stressed. So um, just to point out, this is my dog getting his heartworm treatment. He's got a little shaved spot there in the, in the middle. Um, and again, he did great, although his lungs are on the right. So normal heart and lungs on the left. And you can see, I think you can probably just see the difference. I don't have to go into the, the parts, but the heart is larger and the lungs are, are much whiter. There's all this white patchy stuff and that's all fluid and inflammation. And sometimes that 
that goes away. Sometimes the dog can recover from something like this, but a lot of times not that damage is there forever. So um, dollar bill is still, his lungs look worse actually than they did when we started treatment because his uh, disease has just progressed to where he's got chronic bronchitis almost verging also on, on COPD for humans. So, um, you know, I thought, oh gosh, we'll get him through this and things will, you know, all that inflammation will subside. And that's not, it's not always the case. A lot of dogs do great. And again, they go back to normal, but um, not always. So. Uh, A couple anecdotal things on what Ashley said as well. Um, with the th three injections, I know she mentioned it's painful, um, but it's not like a vaccine. It's like in into their spine almost. So it's pretty brutal to see your dog. It's a, And they're not only in the pain when they're getting it, usually it's a good 24 hours that they just look absolutely miserable. So for those of us that our dogs are like our whole lives, it's pretty brutal to see your dog go through that. Um, and then with the exercise restriction, um, I used to always be like, but really how long do you have to do that? Um, and truly, really, was one of those horrible shelter environment things. Uh, a foster brought in their dog and it was just excited from being in the car and then came in to the shelter. So it wasn't it really like it was running around, but its heart rate was elevated from excitement. Um, and I remember this dog walking to the shelter and jumping up on someone to say hello. And then it passed away like in that moment. And it was truly from its excitement and it throwing a blood clot, I mean, throwing a, a worm when they're breaking off in pieces, like Ashley said, it, it caused a blood clot and the dog literally passed away in that moment. And that made me really understand worms are dying. You cannot elevate the heart stress wise, excitement wise, any of those. Um, and so what I've seen is people that have young dogs, they often ask their vet for a little bit of a sedative of sorts, like a trazodone or something. Um, Cause it is hard. You, you can't have a dog like on cage rest the whole time they do get excited. So sometimes you need a little help during those that time for them to get past that hump. Okay, but here's what we got. Why do we still test if we are on preventative year round? Um, this is a big one. It is people, you know, the tests get expensive every year to do them. Um, but like any medication that we're on too, nothing is a hundred percent. There are breakthroughs and it, it's not as uncommon as people think. I've had a good friend who worked at a vet's office. She was an employee at a vet's office and her dog tested positive for heartworms and she had been on preventative her entire you know, time. Um, but if you are on preventative all the time and you purchase your prevention from a reputable vet source, the brands usually will cover the treatment. So that's one huge portion of it. Um, I know people sometimes try to like go around and buy from, I don't want to say sketchy, but less, uh, you know, cheaper places. But if you do buy prevention from vets offices, et cetera, and by chance have a breakthrough, the brand, I've seen it multiple times, the brand cover it. So um, I just, that's why we test is because it's not a hundred percent. Nothing is a hundred percent. And the last thing you want is to not test and then think your dog is fine. And a year or two later, it start coughing. And then you're too far along because you never tested it and caught it early. Um, my dog lives indoors. I think I hear that every day too. And my comeback every time is that I live indoors also, but I get a lot of mosquito bites, a lot. Um, and even just walking my dog outdoors, I'll come in with 18 mosquito bites just for the five minutes we're outside. Um, so it's not just outdoor dogs that are at risk. Even if your dog lives inside, you can get a mosquito bite in a second. A mosquito flies in when I just open my door. Um, so that's why they, inside dogs, we hope all dogs are inside dogs, but um, they definitely absolutely need to be on prevention as well. Um, and then this is an ongoing, we're learning more and more about, you know, areas that aren't as prevalent, like where Ashley is in Colorado versus me in the South. Um, you know, if I'm in a a market or an environment that doesn't have as many mosquitoes that's more dry why does my dog have to be on prevention and we're just seeing that the environment is constantly changing every area is being warmer and warmer um, you know as the temper or temperature changes plus 
prevention often covers a lot of other worms, the intestinal worms that we talk about often, uh, round worms, tapeworms, etc. If your dog goes to doggy daycare, if your dog walks in the soil that other dogs are also going to the bathroom and all of those kind of things can be picked up and prevention covers those things. So most of the time we don't want that being spread around either and being passed from pet to pet if you have multiple dogs. So staying on prevention kind of avoids all of that anyway. Um, even if you live in a market that's not as prevalent as the South. Oh, it's not letting me change the slide. Oh, there it did. Okay. Is heartworm contagious? I remember asking this way before I got into rescue, which again makes me realize that, you know, the normal person, your vet tells you to like give a heartworm preventer preventative, and you just do it and you don't even know why you're giving it or what have you. Um, so it's the same, it comes up a lot when we ask fosters to foster heartworm uh, positive dogs and they're worried about what if their dog catches it. So it's not contagious dog to dog because it's transmitted by mosquitoes. So as Ashley said earlier, a mosquito has to be involved in the process of biting the uh, infected dog and then transmitting it to another dog. So if you ever bring in a heartworm positive dog via adoption or foster, et cetera, your current pets are not going to catch it from that dog. It's different. Those other worms that we talked about that are in the soil, those are kind of the transferable worms. Um, but heartworm, which is really the most dangerous, is not transferable between dog to dog. Another one, natural uh, prevention and certainly treatment. Um, is a hot topic right now, but someone said to me once that worms are natural, which they are. They're part of the environment, they're natural themselves. Um, there's still um, not enough natural to really prevent your dog from getting heartworm and certainly not treating heartworm. Um, and there's a lot of natural remedies that actually can hurt your dog. We see a lot coming in of essential oils. Um, we talk about that we like light a citronella candle, but it doesn't keep all the mosquitoes away from us either. So it's just not foolproof enough to risk. Again, if it was a diff, even if it was fleas, that's different than something that can truly be a death sentence to your dog. So um, we understand not wanting to put uh, too many things in your dog's diet and to, on their fur, but this is a life or death kind of problem that natural remedies are really risky um, for them to take on. Um, so as far as Dr. Ashley and me in a shelter, we see so much heartworm that we don't think natural is the way to go in that, but you know, you can talk to your own vet about it as well. Um, and do you need it year round? Again, so similar to what I said um, earlier, if your dog is interacting um, with other dogs, going to doggy daycare, those other worms that prevention covers, um, tapeworms, uh, round worms, et cetera, they could pick up in the uh, soil. It's better to just cover yourself and or even risk uh, having mosquitoes be around longer. Uh, Ashley is in Colorado and we put this picture where she had a mosquito in April where you're like, what? It's cold in Colorado. How could there be a mosquito? You just never know. So our thought is like, why would you risk it versus just keep up with it? I had a similar situation. I, I was in that mindset too of not wanting to give prevention if I didn't have to. So a lot of people in the South stop it in like October through January, but it really doesn't get cold enough here. Um, it's just safer to do it year round and make sure your dog doesn't get it, to have to go through that pain, plus go through the expense. I, I will never not do a month of prevention based on how many heartworm positive dogs we see in general. <laughs> Yeah, I always like to say heartworms, uh, mosquitoes don't choose six months out of the year to, you know, be around and be infect infective. Uh, so it's really hard to, to do that just that six months sometimes or choose, is it, you know, April through October, you know, May through November, I don't know. So yeah, did I miss anything on the natural, Ashley? Anything else on the natural that I missed? No, I think that there's just not like we don't have any proven products uh, that that will treat heartworm for sure. Um, you saw what we have to do to treat adult heartworms. Um, I guarantee if there was something safer and 
effect, more effective, you know, we would be all for that because it's not fun to have to do that protocol on dogs. Um, but, you know, there aren't any products that are, that are proven to, to treat besides the ones that are, are out there um, that your veterinarian can, can talk to you about too. So. I'm going to bring this back to gray muzzle too. Um, very common when a dog is old, there's a fear to put them through heartworm treatment. Um, but we are seeing dogs live so much longer. I continue to hear of like labs that live to be 16. It almost makes me jealous of my dogs that have passed away when they were younger. Um, so Walter, again, was a dog I adopted. He was 15-ish is the, the guess when I brought him home and was heartworm positive. And so everyone was like, why would you put him through treatment? But we knew heartworm was going to lead to death. So it was better to treat him and let him live a good life versus let heartworms keep destroying his heart. Um, and that, that was taken care of in three months where we can then let him not have to be um, worrying about his heart constantly getting worse and worse as he was enjoying his life. So this is a really important one to us as we continue to save senior dogs. I have never put a senior dog through heartworm treatment and had a complication. We put a Mastiff through heartworm treatment that was, I want to say 13 years old. I didn't even know Mastiffs lived to be 13 through heartworm treatment, <laughs> totally fine. Whereas if we didn't, we knew the heartworms were going to be the end. There's no it's not going to end in death. It's going to end in death. So, but Walter was such a great example. I mean, look at the difference of when he was in the shelter versus riding around town. He just like glows of happiness. Um, he was just one that like some dogs are more like homebody dogs. My love of my life dog was a very homebody dog, but Walter was like wanting to be out on the town at all times. Sometimes I would just drive him around the block just to like make him feel like he went somewhere. Um, so Aww. he. <laughs> wanted to like meet people at all times so I would take him to like restaurant patios etc and so he was almost like a spokes dog to explain to people that like being old does not mean you're like down and out um whereas I'm so glad that heartworms weren't what you know took him in the end he got to live a true retirement I, I called it retired at the beach because he just like went out almost every day and just was so living his best life into the end days. So he's an example that age is not a disease. Making sure they're healthy until they're, you know, time to go is really what's most important to let them, you know, feel comfortable, feel their best. You go on. I love that, Jackie. Oh, so, so that kind of concludes our, our heartworm talk. Uh, if you're looking for more information or if you, you know, want to make sure that you have good information that's correct um, about heartworm, because again, there's, there's so much out there. I know it can be really challenging to kind of get through and weed through Google sometimes, but Amer the American Heartworm Society is the place. They have great resources for owners uh, and, and veterinarians as, as well. And they really do a good job about, again, trying to make sure that the, the info is up to date and, and they're keeping on top of all of the studies and research out there. Um, Companion Animal Parasite Council, if you ever want to be really freaked out about all of the infectious diseases out there and where, where they're finding them, go to this website. Um, this is a map of, of Colorado from Oh no, maybe this is the other one, the pet disease alerts. But anyways, CAPC uh, has information about literally everything. And they also do a lot of tracking, uh, which is where we mostly get a lot of our, our numbers when we're looking at diseases like heartworm. So, and then pet disease alerts, that's what this uh, picture is of. And this is my state and it's just showing the number of animals that are testing positive. So there's quite a bit of red on there. Uh, for Colorado, I would say. And uh, again, I think we're, we're seeing more, more cases. Uh, we have a lot of animals coming in from out of state, more positive dogs coming in, uh, more mosquitoes, and that just means more risk of, of transmission there. So I think the biggest resource that, that Jackie and I can, can tell you is your veterinarian because your vet knows your dog and what in your lifestyle and you know your area and I think that's a really important thing to get information from your vet 
in terms of what would work best uh, for you and, and your family. I think that's just such an important relationship to uh, develop, especially if you don't have a vet or have recently moved or something. I think I know it's I know it's been hard uh, with a lot of vets since COVID trying to get in and, and all of that, but really trying to pick that back up and foster that relationship and making sure you have someone that you trust and that you like and that that kind of meets you know your values for your family, I think is is really, really important. Because some places out there, they still, you know, there are plenty of places in Colorado that will say, yeah, we don't, we don't see it and we don't recommend it. And, you know, it's one of those things where, again, I think it has to be a discussion between you and your vet. I still will always recommend it in Colorado, but um, yeah, definitely, definitely talk to your vet. So biggest takeaways, heartworm is a disease from mosquitoes, a worm that's transmitted by mosquitoes. No other way to get it. You can't get it in a poop. They can't get it from sniffing something. It has to be a mosquito biting a dog. I think uh, we kind of touched on this. It, it is really common to hear worm. And we think when we think worms, <clears throat> we often think of the intestinal worms. So when you send in a poop sample, you're looking for hookworms and tapeworms and roundworms, all of these intestinal worms. And they're not the, not the same, um, even though heartworm is still a worm. The only way you're going to get it is by uh, mosquitoes. So, um, I think we kind of hit home on the, the dewormer. D when we say dewormer, we are talking about intestinal worms. We're not talking about heartworm. It'll always be heartworm preventative and then dewormer for, for the worms that are in the poop. So hopefully this was informative, uh, for you guys. And, uh, thank you for, for listening to us again, Jackie and I are so passionate about Heartworm, obviously, and uh, the Grey Muzzle organization. So we're just thrilled that you have joined us for this. And uh, I think we probably have some questions, maybe. We do, and one along those lines, and it's probably okay. the most important, but there's a few others. Um, in regards to worms in equal or doing like a fecal test versus a heartworm test, and I, I mean, that comes up so much like, oh, I did a fecal test. Wouldn't that test for heartworms? You have to do a blood test or else you do not know if your dog is heartworm positive or not. So that I take that away too, no matter what. It, you have to do the heartworm test. It does not show up in your fecal test. Um, but someone is asking, are the dead worms seen in the fecal di discharge when they're, no? No, no. So um, yeah, you wouldn't see them in the poop. Ever. Yeah. The only times, I mean, and you don't even see the dead worm pieces unless, you know, do an, uh, an autopsy or we call it a, a necropsy and, and they've had complications. Uh, so you could, you could see them then, but otherwise we don't, we don't ever see the, the dead worms anywhere. So that's just yeah. super important because people do tend to look for worms in the fecal way before they even know if their dog is positive or not. But um, yeah, you do have to do the blood draw. We showed a picture of the test to know if your dog is positive or not. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's asking, how do you differentiate between the type of worms in the blood sample? So do only the adult worms show up? <clears throat> so the type of worms, I, I don't know if this means, you know, heartworms versus hookworms or roundworms or anything like that, but um, it goes back to the heartworm test that we do. It's very specific for a protein that the heartworm produces, only the heartworm. So it's called the antigen. Uh, and so it's really specifically testing just for that. Uh, you will see that in poop samples nowadays in fecals. A lot of times they'll, they'll test for hookworm antigen or tapeworm antigen. Uh, and so sometimes your vet might talk about that as well but that's a protein that that specific worm is producing and that test is looking specifically for that. I don't know if that answers the, the question or not. Certainly if you need more, more clarification, but yeah, that heartworm test, I guess I should say too, on some of the heartworm tests, they'll look for other, uh, particularly tick-borne disease. So bacteria, so they'll look for things like Ehrlichia or Lyme um, will be on that, that same test sometimes. But again, it's very specific to whatever they're they're testing for. Um, yeah. And we'll send out this PowerPoint and 
truly, if we know we're giving you a ton of information. So if you have questions, we're both open. I mean, I'll probably direct anything technical to Ashley, but um, yeah, we're completely open to any question after the fact too. If like after you walk away and you're like, oh, I wish I would have asked that. So that's totally fine as well. Um, someone asked yeah. if cats are affected, which I think we meant to mention as well. So Dr. Yeah. Ashley. Do you want me to? So cats can be, uh, they can be infected, but uh, it's much less common. So they're much more resistant um, to getting heartworm for whatever reason. I feel like it's, again, nature. It's so crazy how things work. So they, they can get it, but they often, if they do, they can clear it, uh, not like dogs do. And so um, in some cases, they can get really, really sick and have heart and lung issues uh, and those cases are often often deadly, but that's very, very uncommon. A lot of times if they uh, get heartworm, then they can clear it. So actually a crazy story when I was in vet school, my cat, I don't know where he was from. He was from the shelter in Fort Collins and we had free heartworm test night at school and we were testing cats, which we don't normally test them for that, but they were... I don't know, the companies were doing free tests. So we tested him and he was positive. And then we did a confirmatory test and he had truly been infected with heartworm. And he was he was able to clear it, he was fine. Um, I think I retested him and everything, it went away. But it was one of those things where all of the parasitologists were sitting around being like, this is not, this doesn't happen. We, we don't see this. So very, very rare. So, and same thing for people. Uh, I think I told... I, I can't remember. I think it's like 50 cases in the last hundred years or so, something like that. Maybe it's vice versa. I can't remember, Jackie, if you if you remember. I looked it up, but very, very, very uncommon. But uh, there are some human reported cases, too. So, wow. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. Someone was asking about whipworms, probably when we were talking about the other, um, which those would show up in fecal um, and are more of an intestinal. So those are the things mm -hmm. where you use dewormer. Um, and when you would turn in a fecal, um, anytime you go to the vet, like once a year, six, every six months, um, it's good to bring a stool sample. So you can just double check that all those things, because those are the more transferable when, I mean, we forget that like everywhere our dog goes to the bathroom, all these other dogs are going to the bathroom as well. And they're walking in that. So, and they're just really common, all these whipworms, uh, roundworms, hookworms, hookworms are a rough one. Um, especially if you're getting a dog from a shelter and not because they're trying to, again, full class one, they will treat all those things, but sometimes they need a, a, another round of treatment as well. So yeah, but those are easily treatable, um, very different than heartworms. Okay, yeah. this is a, a longer question. So the mosquitoes this summer were particularly vicious. I used an essential oil, peppermint, citronella, bug repellent on my senior beagle, but it seemed ineffective as the clouds of mosquitoes seemed to follow her around the backyard, severely limiting our outdoor time. She is on heartworm preventative, but what else can I do? Spraying the yard kills the beneficial bugs and isn't safe for humans and dogs. So what else can she do? Oh, that's such a, that's, a, I mean, that's a great, great question. And that's, um, you know, something that we struggle with. I think you are doing a lot already by having your dog on a, a preventative um, monthly. And again, we know those aren't always 100%. Sometimes people will say that you can use some of the insect repellents like DEET um, if you are really in an area or you're going, you know, camping or something like that, um, which is hard because that's obviously chemical and things like that. And, you know, I, I know people have feelings about those things, but, um, you know, that's probably the biggest thing is like staying out of areas as best possible. There's not a great, oh gosh, 100% you do this and you fix it. And that's why I think we struggle with this disease still. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And, um, there aren't a lot of great options. You can keep your dog covered, but a lot of animals don't like that. Uh, too, but as hard as it is for you to keep mosquitoes off of yourself with those things, um, it's the same for the dogs. I do feel like, you know, having a thicker coat sometimes is, is helpful in those situations, depending on your, your breed of dog there too, but you can't change what you, what you have. And, uh, you, I think all you can do is, is continue to, to use as many precautions as you can like that. So, 
Uh, someone chimed in, that I don't even know if I'm pronounce this right, there are nematode options for backyards that address fleas. I'm not sure if they address mosquitoes too. I don't know what nematode is though. Um, you know. Like some of these worms, yeah. I don't know much about them, to be honest. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely more familiar with the uh, preventatives in terms of dewormers and, and things like that that go directly um, in, in an animal. So, um, but that's something to certainly we can look into for sure. I can get back to you. And I appreciate not wanting to kill the good bugs too. So that's nice. Right. I mean, just they right. play a role in the ecosystem. So that's good. Okay. It's and so this hard. one, um, I mean, I think your dog is a good example of it, but does a severe heartworm infection pre-adoption shorten a dog's lifespan even after treatment? And I will defer to Dr. Ashley, but just one thought of my own, because I've seen so much heart, probably more than the average person, because I'm in the South and, uh, you know, been in shelters. Um, my opinion is just that it really varies. I mean, you could have a super high, we call it high heartworm positive, put them through treatment, and that dog might not have a, a ton of long-term damage. And then the next dog down the line might be high heartworm positive and actually have a shortened lifespan because of it. So um, I wouldn't ever want someone to like not adopt the dog thinking like, oh, I'm gonna only have him for a couple of years because he was high heartworm positive because it varies so much dog to dog. And that could be predisposition to other stuff. Maybe they had a heart issue to start with, et cetera. Um, but I'll let Ashley touch on the long-term effects it can have or shorten it yeah. in the lifespan. No, I, I mean, I think you're exactly right, uh, Jackie, is that you can't, you can't always predict how they're going to do and what their, their prognosis is. I would say the majority of dogs that you treat probably have minimal um, complications or minimal impacts on their life moving forward. But there are those animals like my kiddo that I thought, oh gosh, we're going to treat him and all of this inflammation is going to go away in his lungs. And I think it was just so progressed and maybe there's something in his body. He's more um, inflammatory. His body's more reactive to heartworms. And so, you know, we saw that chronic damage and, you know, sometimes the, the cardiologists, uh, the heart doctors, when they look at these dogs, sometimes the if you can imagine all those heartworms clogging the heart and then they start to change the way the heart looks because it can't pump the same way. And so it's working harder and it gets bigger in areas. Sometimes if you kill those worms, those, those areas can shrink back down, but sometimes not always. And they'll have chronic, chronic heart issues. I think it is really hard to predict. However, I do feel like the majority of cases, I can't say down the road, oh gosh, yep, that's what got them, their heartworm complications. I think it's less frequent, uh, but it's very, very individualized. It would never, uh, the chances of having chronic damage would never stop me from treating a dog though. So. And out for my own, again, anecdotal, the picture for this webinar, my cutie dog, Tally, um, she was <laughs> estimated eight years old and heartworms and she is like, she's a wild child. I thought she was supposed to be older. <laughs> um, so it, they certainly could be just fine. I hope it wouldn't deter anyone from adopting a heartworm positive dog because um, they're phenomenal. And because it's treatable, I, I hope it would encourage people to adopt a heartworm positive so they could just get through that one um, obstacle and then live a wonderful life. Because this girl pulled a fast one on me and, <laughs> um, you know, is living her best life. So, but thank you guys. I mean, this was so great for us to be able to talk about something we're passionate about. We know it's a ton of information. Um, so again, if you think of something later, please feel free to email and we will get back to you individually. Um, and I know we're a little over, so if you have to run, no problems at well. Uh, okay. okay. Awesome. Anything um, else? I think there's one more question. Is there a specific uh -huh. type of mosquito that transmits the disease? <clears throat> That's a, that's actually a really good question. And I don't know that the, um, answer to it. Um, uh, I do think some mosquito species are more susceptible and, and more easily, probably more easily transmitted. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head, if there's truly like that one type of mosquito. Um, but I can certainly look into that as well. I think I just lumped them all together and I, I'm sure they have a purpose 
somewhere. We don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. They carry all of the diseases that carry them you know, West Nile, uh, you know, dengue fever, all the bad things come from mosquitoes. So, um, yeah. I would say Someone a lot out there. of mosquitoes carry it. That's all I'm saying. All <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would love to know if there's a good purpose on this, in this world for mosquitoes. I'm sure there is somewhere out there. So. And I think it comes down um, to the blood, you know, mosquitoes are taking in blood and then, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank Great. you guys again. Thank you for supporting yeah, Gray Muzzle. You. Yes, go check out the website. We have new t-shirts, calendars coming out. Yes. It's going to be great. All right. <laughs> Take care, thank everybody. Thank you for tuning in. See you Thanks. soon. Bye-bye.